All right, let's talk about mannerism art. Uh, artists had gained a lot of technical knowledge during the Renaissance, such as the use of oil paints perspective, which would never again be lost in the Dark Ages. Another new development at this time was rudimentary archaeology. The mannerist artists now had actual works from antiquity to study. No longer did they need to use their respective imaginations when it came to classical stylization. That said, the mannerist artists almost seemed determined to use their power for evil, artist evil. Where high Renaissance art was natural, graceful, balanced, harmonious, the art of mannerism was quite different. While technically masterful, mannerist compositions were full of clashing colors, disquieting figures with abnormally elongated limbs, emotion, and bizarre themes that combined classism, Christianity, and mythology. All right, let's take a look at the burial of Count Orgaz. Um, the artist was El Greco. El Greco is an enigmatic artist about whom we know surprisingly little. This curious masterpiece is a huge picture painted in 1586 to commemorate the burial of Count Orgaz, who died <clears throat> approximately 250 years earlier. It is said that as the count was laid to rest, a miracle occurred. Two, saint, two saints descended from the heavens and placed his body in the tomb. The painting was commissioned by the church of San Tom in Toledo, which was then the capital city of Spain and the headquarters of the Spanish church. It is still hangs there today in a side chapel above the count's grave. Highly esteemed in his own lifetime, El Greco was subsequently dismissed as a technically inept and mentally unstable until rediscovered in the 20th century by avant-garde artists such as Picasso. Uh, and this does have some remnants of uh, a Picasso-like painting that would come sometime later. All right, let's take a look from top to bottom. Up here we have Christ. Um, you know, he's at the top. Um, we have uh, his mother, Mary, and John the Baptist right here. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, we actually have Philip II, who was trying to turn most of Europe into a Catholic society. Um, Mary is reaching down with her left hand to uh, help the angel get the soul of the count, who is down here and, and has passed away. I'm separating... Um, the heavens from the earth, we have all of these faces, which were the prominent Spanish um, people at the time. Um, we have uh, a monk right here, the reflecting monk, who is uh, in a very similar, if not identical, pose as to this uh, priest on the right-hand side. Um, his son, the Count's son, is down here, um, and um, we can see that what is it that links um, the earth to the heavens is this crucifix that kind of goes up in the air coming from the priest, once again emphasizing the church. All right, here's another El Greco uh, painting, The Repentant Magdalene. The Repentant Magdalene is an oil painting on canvas measuring 42 inches by 40 inches and placed in a square frame. It depicts... Mary Magdalene at its focal point, sitting front and center against a backdrop of a cloudy sky and dark earth. Her large and glossy eyes are raised towards the sky, and her hands lay folded in her lap. Um, you know, clearly, um, she, you know, she's looking to the heavens. Um, she's trying to say, you know, seem peaceful. Um, the overall effect of her pose is demure and contemplative. There is a small glass face and a human skull grouped together. Uh, in the lower left-hand corner over here, uh, and place next to her. The positioning and general composition create a harmonious and unified quality about it. All the lines are even and purposeful in creating the soft and round shapes of both the landscape and Mary Magdalene's body. The obvious lack of jagged shapes and purposeful attempt to be smooth carries over to the general texture of the entire piece. While the background is primarily made up of unblended splashes of color, they cooperate to create a flowing feeling that is supposed to represent the motion of the sky. The eyes in the glass vase stand out from, um, from the smoothness, but that is purely because they are very glossy and dewy. 
The color selection was also purposeful to play into the calm, thoughtful demeanor of the piece. It is full of cool colors like blues, browns, and greens, with hints of warms, warm ones as ornaments in the tint of her hair and of the skull. Well, that's a good Parma Janino's uh, work Madonna with a long neck. The Madonna does not have normal human proportions. Her neck, shoulders, and even her fingers are elongated and make her appear more elegant and graceful. Her hair is also elaborately curled with decorated and with pearls to frame her beautiful face and comp complexion. The robes she is wearing is luxurious and flowing. <laughs> flowing robes. The artist has stretched and lengthened body parts in this painting in a strange and impulsive way. The angel's leg in the foreground is glossy and suggestive. Um, whilst the prophet holding up his scrolls looks emancipated and gaunt. Um, and that would be this you know, little guy down here. The lavish, inviting image of the Madonna, combined with the crowds of angels in various states of undress, have led some to believe the artist was trying to eroticize the scene. An oversized Christ child displayed across the Madonna's, Madonna's lap. The way his arm is hanging freely down is also a pose suggestive of death, adding to the ambiguity surrounding the painting. Uh, and here you can see the arm kind of flopping down. Instead of giving a sense of equilibrium and balance in the arrangement, the artist has chosen to pack all the angels claustrophobically on the left-hand side, uh, yet the space to the right is open. And the only thing that you can see on the right is, is actually uh, St. Jerome down here, who has been reduced in size to just around the size of her knee. The viewer's eye is forced to restlessly move around the painting in order to take in all the disproportions of the tiny Saint Jerome to the overbearing large figure of the, the Madonna. Even the architecture surrounding of the Madonna looks to be out of proportion with the strange sized column which looks to have no base or supporting any structures behind it. So they're talking about this thing, you know, back here and it's just a freestanding whatever. Well that wouldn't usually fly in the old days. There'd have to be something attached to it. Look, look at uh, Florentino's The Deposition from the Cross. The upper figures are frozen in a moment of frenzied, grief-laden activity, carrying the body precariously down from the cross. Uh, the lower figures uh, seem to exist almost in another reality, serving as a symbol of anguish devoid of activity suggested in the upper half of the painting. So right here in the middle, uh, there is you know, kind of a border between the top half of the painting and then you've got the bottom half of the painting. The tall figure with red hair, traditionally St. John, is widely considered to be a self-portrait of Florentino himself, over here on the right-hand side. By including himself in the composition, he becomes part of the emotional intensity of his own work. The position he is in, stooped over in anguish with his head buried in his hands, accentuates this. The colors of the deposition of the cross are bold, dramatic, um, inspiring feelings of horror and grief. The body of Christ is a sickly green hue, his reddish hair clashing with the cadaverous tones of his skin. Where uh, previous depictions of the deposition tended to focus more on the scene itself, the action, the background, and often idealized figures, Florentino's work focuses solely on the emotion. The background is practically non-existent, channeling all of the viewer's energy on the figures stopped in their tracks. The harsh and unnatural lighting seems to come from a flash from above, freezing the participants in a snapshot moment of time. All right, here's another one of Florentino's works, Moses Defending the Daughters of Jethro. Um, above all else, this painting serves as a testament to action and celebration of the male nude. The figures are extremely muscular, powerful, and broad, taking a clear inspiration from Michelangelo's work. Arranged in complicated position, Moses' opponents appear as a tangled mass 
rather than individuals. By contrast, the female's hair is arranged in an elaborate fashion, which is typical of Florentino's touch. So you got all of Moses' foes who he's fighting down here, and then you got this you know, pretty girl, and she's got her hair all done up up here in the upper right-hand corner. The texture of the skin and the garments of the figures engaged in this scene take on a smooth, glossy feel due to the broad panes of light and color. It is speculated that Moses is depicted twice in Florentino's arrangement, both as the focal point in the center delivering blows to the shepherds. Um, so you can see him uh, right here, you know, swinging away. Um, <clears throat> and also as the figure in red rushing in forcefully to save his future bride. And uh, that would be uh, Moses up here, um, appears to be sprinting in from the left-hand side of the painting. He has all strength and power and movement with the eye drawn in circular clockwise motion from his left arm up to the purposeful stride, the billows of his red garment, and back again through his upturned right arm in a central figure. Um, so you can see how that's, you know, the action of the painting uh, goes in, in this direction. Um, the positioning of the figures form an X shape with Moses' groin providing the central point of the composition. X this accentuates the celebration of masculinity. All right, let's look at Tintoretto's The Last Supper. The painting has complete darkness dominating everywhere. On the top of the painting, there is a bulb of light, and on both sides of the top, there are many flying images. Um, so we see that light right up here, and then we see the images on the left around the light, and then over here also on the right. Uh, there is a supper table with so many human images, and among them there is a big halo of light on the head of the man who is Jesus. So, you know, here's a supper table, and here is Jesus, uh, you know, either breaking bread or giving uh, his disciples something to uh, drink. The other people um, around the supper table are uh, the disciples. There are some roughly dressed people in front of the supper table, and they are totally indifferent to what is going on uh, with the supper. And, and, you know, that would be these people down here. Um, <clears throat> the painting uh, is based on the Christian belief related to the Last Supper of Jesus, in which Jesus was given bread and wine. He had 12 disciples participating in the supper, and it also is believed that Jesus was preaching the spiritual ideas to his disciple. It is also said that, that his disciples promised Jesus that they would go to the ignorant human world and they would tell the words of Jesus to the ignorant people. The complete darkness in this painting not only reflects the darkness of you know, supper time, but it also symbolizes the domination of ignorance in the human world. The painter has been criticized in this painting because of the lack of realism. It is said that there were 12 disciples in the supper, but here in the painting the exact number of disciples is actually not reflected. Similarly, the painter should have given more light on the face of Jesus and his good disciples. Um, but uh, the betrayer Judah is not even identified clearly in this painting. Um, so this is you know, quite a uh, difference than uh, Leonardo's The Last Supper, but uh, there are many different themes going on in this one. Uh, the most important would be darkness. All right, let's look at Karkuri, um, Joseph in Egypt. Uh, this work traditionally entitled it, Joseph in Egypt depicts the most significant episodes of Joseph reuniting with his family of origin. Uh, it is divided into four zones. In the left foreground, you have uh, Joseph introducing his family, um, who he invited to move to Egypt to the pharaoh. According to Vasari, the boy with the dark cloak and brown tunic sitting on the first step of the stairs on which the figures are arranged is a portrait of the young um, Bronzino. Uh, so that's that little boy right down here. Um, <clears throat> on the right, Joseph is sitting on a triumphal cart pulled by three pudi. Remember, the pudi are the little uh, angels that are flying around. Um, so we've got uh, Joseph down here on his little rolly cart, and here are the pudi pulling him along. There's another one helping him out, and then there's another one up here on this pedestal. Uh, hoisting himself <clears throat> up with his left arm and clutching firmly on another pooty with the other, he bends toward a kneeling figure who is presenting him a petition or reading him a message. A fifth pudo wrapped in a piece of cloth blown by the wind dominates the scene from the top of the column. 
appearing to mime the gesture of one of the two half-living statues represented in the top left and center of the painting. A restless crowd, curious to see what is going on, throngs the adjacent space between the two buildings in the background. Um, and here is, whoop, here is the crowd right over here checking things out. Um, <clears throat> other mysterious figures resting against one of the large boulders that dominate the landscape turn their attention toward the action of the foreground. The clothes, expressions, and <clears throat> features of all these figures are inspired by Northern European painting, as is the large castle and surrounding trees depicted in the background, and that would be up here uh, in the background. On the unrailed staircase of the imposing cylindrical building to the right, Joseph takes one of his children by the hand, higher up, the other is greeted affectionately by his mother. Um, and we can see that right here on this staircase. Lastly, Joseph and his sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, are portrayed inside the room at the top of the building where Jacob, now old and near death, imparts a paternal blessing. The curious combination of all of these elements confers to the painting an anomalous and intriguing quality. Uh, and here is that action where he is old and infirm and, and on his deathbed. Quite a picture. Well, let's take a look at Raphael's entombment. In entombment, Christ is not actually being entombed or being taken from the cross, but is in the process somewhere in the middle of those two actions. In the background is a Mount Calvary, back up here where the crosses are located, where Jesus was crucified, and just to the left is the tomb in which Jesus was to be buried. And that would be over here where this dark space is. You can kind of see they're going up the stairs here. <clears throat> the picture painted by Raphael is meant to draw viewers in and feel as if they are onlookers on the process of Jesus being entombed and part of the crowd watching his burial. Raphael seems to detach himself from the painting and shows the mourners in his own way. Instead of the people in the painting being distraught, they are sad in a less dramatic and intense way. The sadness is hinted at, but not completely overpowering. So if you look at, you know, these people, you know, obviously this is um, mom over here and, you know, she's pretty distraught, but you don't see any tears. She's just merely, you know, passed out or whatever. But uh, you don't see that from the other people. Um, during the High Renaissance, putting shapes into paintings was a common practice. In the entombment, Raphael uses the arms of the two men to, and Jesus to create a V-shape. So we got the V-shape going right here um, with Jesus, you know, kind of in the middle. The whole crowd then follows suit and are in the same direction and angles of the arms that the men are of carrying Jesus. So you can see how these people are kind of leaned back in a uh, V-shaped direction as well as uh, these people on the left. Another uh, peculiar part of this painting is that Nicodemus is not looking at Jesus or those around him. He, uh, rather, he is looking straight at the viewer. And here is Nicodemus right here in the middle. Uh, this technique could uh, be Raphael's way of including the audience in the scene and drawing them in even more so that they feel as if they are there and experiencing the event as well.